Is romantic love an illusion? Or is it that we have illusions about it? Illusions are a, a big topic, also a challenging topic, because for one thing, I'm subject to illusions myself. However, it's such an important topic that I wanted to do something with it. I decided to approach it through the issue of romantic love because that touches the lives of so many people and helps make the material practical rather than just philosophical. Now briefly, my background that could be relevant here is that I built and ran a free dating website for about 10 years from about the year 2000 to the year 2010. So with insights out of running a dating website will also come out to this material. First I'd like to look at the topic of illusions itself and to briefly go into that so we can try and create some kind of simple framework in which we can then use to look at the issue of romantic love. And as part of that we'll touch briefly on what others have to say about the nature of illusion and the nature of ultimate reality. So once we've got our framework in place, we can look at some specific issues that can make a difference in how we perceive and experience romance and romantic relationships in our life. In what ways do any illusions we might have about romantic love either cause the relationship to fall apart, be unnecessarily challenging or not even get started in the first place? We tend to see a relationship that doesn't turn out the way we want it to do is a failure, especially if it's some kind of painful separation or divorce involved. Perhaps that in itself is an illusion that the perception of failure of relationships is actually an illusion. There's another way we can look at them. Those apparently failed relationships were actually successes from another perspective. We can also look at the ways in which we can improve the longevity of a, of a romantic relationship by understanding how our illusions play out in that relationship and making some adjustments if necessary. We have a belief that romantic relationships are supposed to make us happy. Is that true? Or is it an illusion, at least in part? Is that actually a suitable goal for a relationship, that it makes us happy? We can look at ways in which society helps to create and maintain illusions around romantic relationships. Are there ways in which we can use the romantic relationships to fall in love with life itself? Is romantic love an illusion? Or is it that we have illusions about it? And thinking back about the very spiritual teachings I've come across and the various philosophies I've come across over the years, there are a few things said in one way or another by very spiritual teachings. Effectively, they're saying that we live largely in a state of illusion and we're not seeing truth, we're not seeing the reality and some of them go as far to say as we walk in a dream and we live our lives semi-hypnotised. They often see their role as one as waking us up, as helping us to awaken. So on the one hand they're saying we're in some sort of dream state, on the other hand they're saying there is a larger life available to us, so there's a, a wider, deeper perspective and a more real perspective that's available to us. Their teachings are designed to try and help us wake up to that state, to that state of being, that state of awareness. One of the main characteristics of this awakened state that they tell us is a state of love. It's a love far beyond what we normally think of as love. It's beyond human love. It embraces human love, but it's beyond that also. So let's call this state the kind of love from this higher state, enlightened love. We could call it unconditional love, and that's probably a good term for it because it is unconditional, but also has other characteristics as well. So as I just prefer to call it enlightened love for now till we get a chance to explore what some of those other characteristics are. So in a nutshell, the very spiritual teachings essentially say that love is not an illusion and that love is an essential part of this higher state of consciousness or higher awareness or a higher state of being that's available to us as human beings. So love is not an illusion, but we often walk in a fog of illusion as we go through life. 
So this makes me wonder then to what extent is romantic love giving us clues as to what this higher state really is? Is it acting as a bridge between our normal state of consciousness and this higher state of consciousness? Or is it getting in the way of us achieving this higher state of consciousness? So is romantic love helping or hindering (laughs) us to waken up to a a wider reality and a, a higher state of awareness? In other words, is romantic love helping us to find what's real and to see what's real? Or is it itself a distortion and part of the fog that keeps us in a state of unreality, in this dreaming, unawakened state? So if this enlightened love state or this enlightened state is available to us and available to us now, in a sense, then why don't we have it? What's getting in the way? What blocks us experiencing that and what can help us move towards that experience what will assist us in finding this higher state each of us is something within us that's looking to find this higher state this other way of being this other way of living we could call this part of us that's yearning for something higher for something better for something deeper as our inner guide however we might not trust or recognize that part we might actually be resisting what our inner guide is telling us. So therefore, many spiritual teachings arise within human culture to help to assist us and to confirm and affirm what our own inner guide is telling us. Or they try and help awaken us to that inner guide in the direction it's trying to get us to go in. It's like we have something trying to guide us towards our natural spiritual state, this what I'm calling enlightened love, for lack of a better term, But sometimes we resist it or sometimes we get so caught up in the things of daily life, making a living and achieving our goals and trying to make it in the world, all of which has its place. But when we go too far into that, that can distract us from this inner sense of rightness that's trying to take us into a wider life that embraces the ability to live and work in the world, yet also leads us to something higher at the same time. So if we tie together a whole load of different teachings, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and many other different philosophies and and spiritual teachers and gurus, there is a commonality in the teachings. And one of the things that these guides of the race effectively say or imply, that um, they're completely confident that human species will reach this kind of enlightened state Because one way or another, there's not really anywhere else to go. Because the enlightened love state is far more pleasant than anything else. The overall body of spiritual teachings tells us we're trapped in illusions. Not seeing clearly, we're hypnotized. Not only do we have illusions, we actually struggle to keep them in place. We work really hard to keep our illusions. We cling to them. We hold on to them. We don't want to let them go. We put a lot of time and energy into trying to make these illusions real. The very things we're clinging to and trying so hard to make work are the things very often that lead ultimately to some form of disillusionment or dissatisfaction. We realize that those illusions no longer serve us or life intervenes and we have to move out of those illusions and that's often a a painful process. The process of being disillusioned is often painful and uncomfortable because we've identified with what we've created. We can be tempted to base our sense of self-worth on whether we're in a relationship or not and how that relationship is going. Someone may feel that if they're not in a relationship, then there's something wrong and then they must do something about that as quickly as possible. We think of ourselves as I am this, I am that, and their sense of I am, a sense of who we are is locked into that particular illusion. So as the illusion itself is dissolving, We feel as if part of us is dissolving. So we have illusions and we're clinging to them and we're trying to make them work and trying to make them real. Yet all the time the spiritual guides of the race have been telling us that those illusions are what stop us seeing the ultimate reality, that stop us being able to embody this enlightened love state that leads to deepest happiness and fulfillment. In many countries and cultures in the world, romantic love is presented as a way to happiness. In fact, to some it's the way to happiness. But let's really look more deeply at that and to what extent the romantic love does actually lead us towards the goal of enlightened love 
And to what extent is it an illusion that's getting in the way of our experience of enlightened love? So on the one hand, we've got so many aspects of modern culture impressing upon us the importance of romantic love. On the other hand, so many romantic relationships and marriages end in some kind of breakup. If a marriage ends and there's kids involved and there's often lots of financial implications of the ending of the relationship, things can get very bitter and acrimonious as the relationship breaks down. Or there can be a couple who are not really happy together, but they struggle on because of the kids or, or out of the fear of being lonely, having no money or whatever. A large number of romantic relationships either end or they struggle. Of course, there are relationships that do do well. There are marriages that work. And more about that later and some ideas as to why those ones work. So looking at the theme as romantic love and illusion, it helps to really look at the, the overall concept of illusions and how they affect us. Because that will give us a wider view on illusions in general. And then we'll have a, a better perspective for looking at the nature of romantic love itself. So we're looking at illusions so that we have some kind of framework in order to decide which aspects of romantic love may or may not be illusionary. I'd like us to assume that there's mainly two types of illusion. There's one type of illusion where we see something that simply is not there. We see something but it doesn't actually exist. And we think something's true, but it's actually not true at all. For example, in terms of romance, somebody wants to marry us, so we assume it's because they love us. And they may behave in ways which show that they love us, but they might not love us particularly. It may be they desperately want a child and that anybody will do. It might be they're being pressured by their family to find someone and to get on with their lives, or they're desperate to have a partner, or that they believe that as long as they get married, they will be happy ever after, no matter what. So there could be many reasons why somebody would marry us other than the fact that they love us. It could be just a sexual attraction and that the person has convinced themselves that it's love. In such situations, the person may actually fool themselves as much as anyone else because they don't know the difference between a strong sexual attraction with a certain amount of liking and appreciation and love. They just may not know the difference. People can fool themselves and they can fool others at the same time. So that's one type of illusion. We see something and it's just not there. However, there's another type of illusion. And that's when we see something and it is actually there, but we're seeing a very distorted picture of it. So there could be love in the relationship and it can be about bolstering somebody's social standing security, money, power, whatever. So it could be a mix of a genuine love and all sorts of ego issues. When that's the case, then the love aspect doesn't grow to become the most important part of the relationship and those other issues are still there and too strong, the relationship is likely to run into difficulties. So a romantic relationship may be partly about love and partly about things which have not much to do with love. An illusion is not necessarily a bad thing. It might lead us to a greater understanding of life and help us prepare for our next step into a greater truth. So it's like we evolve as a person through different stages of illusion, with each stage having more truth about it. In other words, we sometimes need to evolve from something which is partly true to something which is more true. As I say, a relationship may well be partly about love, but then the love aspect grows and becomes to dominate the relationship. And so it becomes more true in the sense that if the relationship is claimed to be about love, that, that actually becomes more true as the relationship goes on. In the beginning, we may be partly an illusion, thinking this relationship is all about love. When it wasn't, and then later on, it is all about love, or mostly about love. Or it can go the other way, where different things arise in the people's lives. And the love bit fades or money issues come into it too much and those cause the relationship to break apart. There was love in the relationship, but it wasn't enough to withstand the other pressures upon it. Something may be partly an illusion and partly not an illusion. That something being an illusion doesn't automatically make it bad. How do we break free from illusions? How do we break out of them? 
One way to break through illusions is to do some good hard thinking, to really apply our thinking to the situation and think it through. Let's do a bit of hard thinking around the topic of romantic love and our assumptions about it and the way society presents it to us. A large part of the assumption about romantic love is that it's going to make us happy. Overall, people seem to be happier for having relationships with each other. The thought of being alone seems to make a lot of people very miserable. There is some truth in the idea that romantic love will make us happy, but there's also quite a bit of evidence that doesn't particularly make people happy. It's a mixed bag. Can we expect someone else to make us happy? Is that realistic? It depends on the other person, of course, and their willingness to be concerned about our happiness and for how long we'll be concerned about our happiness. But then what happens if this person is out to make us happy, yet we're not happy? There can be a temptation to assume then, oh, I'm not happy and the person I'm with is therefore not making me happy. Perhaps they're the wrong person. We may have the nice house, the car, the kids and the spouse we always wanted, yet somehow we're not happy. Our inner state can only be affected to some extent by another person. There's a large piece we need to do ourselves in order to be happy. No matter what someone else does for us, if we don't have the inner skills, the inner resources to make ourselves happy, then eventually we will be unhappy. If we purely see happiness as something to do with arranging and rearranging external circumstances, ultimately we'll find that that's only part of the solution. And if we begin to doubt this person, or maybe they're not the right person for me after all, then it's going to be even harder for them to make us happy. What contributes to this is the sense that after someone has gone through like a big wedding and a whole year of build-up and the whole process around that and expecting it to be the happiest day of our life, the huge expectations around it, and then once that's over and life gets down to the basic mundaneness, people can go into depression and feel that they've been cheated. Where's this glorious happy ever after that they were promised? And their prince or princess sort of morphs into basically ordinary person, hopefully a decent kind ordinary person, but basically an ordinary person. Dealing with the mundaneness of ordinary life and dealing with perhaps noisy neighbours, less than ideal house circumstances or whatever. The couple can then become very driven to make it in the world and deciding, okay, we're not happy because we don't have enough stuff. Let's get more stuff and we'll be more happy, which may or may help or may or may not work. Now, the other part of this is, can we expect ourselves to make someone else happy? Is that realistic? Maybe for a while. Of course, we can contribute to someone else's happiness. We can do things for them. We can show them kindness and consideration. But if we go too far in trying to make someone else happy, we might find ourselves with more than we can handle. Part of the challenge of trying to make someone else happy is that, yes, we can to some extent, but then there's a point where we just can't anymore. Uh, it gets too exhausting or too much effort. We have to work in a normal daily life and don't have every hour to devote to making them happy. And if they haven't developed the inner resources that I mentioned earlier for making themselves happy, then they're going to begin to see us as a failure. And it's our fault because we promised explicitly or not to make them happy. And society promised them that if they married us, we would make them happy. And they're not happy. Therefore, it must be our fault that they're not happy. Of course, a mature person wouldn't see it that way. But many of us are partway between being not quite mature person and a mature person. We're all in the process of maturing that way. Part of the problem of trying to make someone else happy is that desires tend to escalate. Once you've filled desire on one level, we go to the next level. And if it's our job to make that person happy, then we have to then go up to the next level and then the next and then the next. We're going to begin to wonder, is this person never satisfied? Well, the answer is no, because... Unless they've got the resources inside to make themselves happy, they're never going to be satisfied. As long as they see happiness as coming from outside of ourselves, then we're never really satisfied. Because we're always going to need more and more to come into our lives because we get used to what we've got already. 
So we need bigger, better house, a bigger, better car, a bigger, better whatever. So eventually, if we're trying to make somebody else happy, that their expectations will become enormous. So it reaches the point where we we give them the moon and then they complain because it's got craters on it. So this ends up in a no-win situation. So it could well be that this search for happiness is partly where the truth and partly where the illusion of romantic love comes in. It's around that theme of happiness. Because if we look at what really makes a person happy, and if we look at the various spiritual teachings and consolidate that, really what it boils down to is that what makes a person happy is living by and expressing the highest and best within themselves. It's connecting with a sense of goodness and rightness within themselves and expressing that. Happiness is a state of being. It's not a doing thing. We learn to be happy. We don't do happy. We can do things that will contribute to a state of being happy. And we can do things that take away from our state of being happy. But ultimately, happiness is a state of being. And if we get too caught up in the doing that it takes away from our state of being, then our capacity for being happy never gets developed or gets developed very slightly. There's something within us that quite naturally leads us towards wanting to be happy. That's right and good. That seems to be perfectly reasonable. At the same time, there's things that distract us and gets involved in the world. And that has its place too. There's also something within us that yearns for goodness, that yearns towards the good, and that yearns to have a higher state of awareness, and yearns for a sense of completeness, yearns to go home, yearns to belong. And we have all these yearnings. We look to fulfill those yearnings in a romance. Sometimes romantic love can fulfill those yearnings for a time, and sometimes not. Yet real happiness comes from fulfilling our potential, a capacity to live and be alive in the world, and hopefully leave the world a little bit better place than we found it. Romantic love serves us to the extent that it helps us to discover the highest and best within us and express that in our life. So there's part of us that wants us to express the highest and best within us. And there's another part of us that's really concerned with making it in the world. Sometimes those two can overlap and sometimes they don't. But let's refer to this part of us that wants us to discover and to express the best within us. Let's call that part of us our inner guide. It's this inner guide that's trying to encourage us to live the most noble life we can, to develop and express the finest qualities that we can in life. That inner guide may not be in conflict with us getting into a romantic relationship. That can be a very good way for us to develop the highest and best within us. But that doesn't necessarily mean it will be an easy relationship. To some extent we'll get happiness and fulfillment, but to a certain extent we'll be challenged. As we get challenged, we discover different things about ourselves. We discover ways in which we haven't really grown up and we need to become a more mature and balanced person. There are some ways in which being challenged in a relationship can be really good for us, as long as it doesn't go too far. Of course, it reaches a point where a relationship can be abusive, which is another story. We may have all sorts of ideas around life, assumptions about money, assumptions about members of the opposite sex and how they see things, and we find that our perspective on reality is not the only one. Who has the right of it and who doesn't can take a bit of working out to discover. And even if the relationship eventually ends, we could have learned a lot from each other and grown up as people. It may not end well in terms of a marriage, but can still have been very beneficial in its own way as part of our growth as individuals. The process of growing up and having some of our illusions stripped away and our assumptions about life stripped away can be painful, but obviously it's good in the longer term that we experience that. In a sense, the very purpose of our inner guide is to help us to wake up, which means dropping our illusions, which means we need to see that we have illusions. We have ways we distort reality. And this is all part of our process of trying to get us to reach the ultimate truth, which is to reach this enlightened love state, 
and the sense of freedom and empowerment and release that that brings. The Arana Guide is trying to lead us there, but it's not always an easy road because of the, the illusions we cling to. And as I mentioned earlier, we're actually actively trying to create and support those illusions while our inner guide is trying to free us from illusions. We think a particular thing is going to make us happy when our inner guide knows, well, not really, but it might help us let go of some illusions so we actually can get closer to what will really make us happy. When a relationship breaks up, it can be tempted to go into ugly illusions. So we go from having the pretty illusions and then we start manufacturing ugly illusions. So at first we have all these pretty illusions about how wonderful this person is. And then we flip, go to the flip side. We start having ugly illusions of how horrible they are. And so at first we're making up stories to support how wonderful they are. And then we start making up stories to support how horrible they are. Now that's really true about that person. They were never an angel, but nor are they now a demon. They're not either of those. We go from adoring them to demonizing them, but neither perspective is real. Both are illusionary. Both are distortions of reality. And none of them really serve us in the long term. A relationship with romantic love depends a lot on our relationship with ourselves and with life, because that's the context in which we live. If we follow the inner directions of our inner guide, our inner direction that's trying to help us express the highest and best within us, we'll tend to become increasingly happy and fulfilled. It won't necessarily be an easy road, it might be rough along the way, but it will lead to a deeper and better sense of happiness. If we deny or avoid our inner guide, we may find ourselves living a hollow life, outward success, but inwardly empty and possibly anxious and depressed because we feel there's something fundamentally wrong with our life. And there is something wrong with our life if we've lost our connection with our inner guide. We won't feel supported in life because we've refused the support life has to offer, which is in the form of our connection with our inner guide. Can we be happy and not follow the promptings of the highest and best within us? Not really, can we? Not in the long term. Eventually we're going to get caught out if we deny that inner voice, that inner conscience, that inner guide. So happiness is a state of being. We can be happy. We don't do happy, as I mentioned. So if our state of being is clouded by illusions, something's just not going to feel right, at least not for long. And there'll still be that inner pressure of this highest and best within us trying to guide us towards our greater happiness and deepest fulfillment. We at the same time can be clinging desperately to illusions that we believe were going to make us happy. But they're not going to make us happy because only really listening to our guide is going to make us happy and following the direction that wants to take us in. And we've invested our idea of happiness in something else and given a lot of time and energy to it, now having to face the fact that it didn't quite work the way we wanted it to. Sometimes we can look upon the promptings from an inner guide as something trying to spoil our fun. We treat it as something that's trying to stop us doing what we want to do. When often it's more like a parent who's trying to stop a child playing with fire. It's trying to stop us doing things that will ultimately hurt us. And trying to get us to go in a direction that will actually ultimately be more fulfilling and more nourishing for us. Obviously from one perspective we're living in a material world, we need to be able to function in this world. However, if we get too caught up in the glitz and glamour of the material world, it can get us into patterns of behaviour and activity that don't really support us living out from our highest potential. And the more we get caught up in living in the material world and not listening to our inner guide, then to that extent we're living more and more in a world of illusion as we are caught up in things that don't really serve our development. We're not following our inner guide towards a higher state of being and a higher state of awareness. Our inner guide is trying to get us to move towards that which is for our highest good. Yet we get so caught up in playing with our toys in the world that sometimes we don't listen to that inner guide, we don't listen to that inner voice. And this can get us in, trapped in illusionary situations. 
On the one hand, we need to be able to navigate our way through the material world and have some form of existence which works for us. At the same time, we can't be really happy unless we have our own approval. And having our own approval means having the approval of the highest and best within us. We can get away with chasing money and success up to a point. As long as that aligns with where our inner guide wants us to be going, then it will work. But if we go further than that, then dissatisfaction will start to creep in and become stronger and stronger. That's when we start to really go off balance. And the signs of that going off balance can be stress, anxiety, depression, those sorts of things. As I was saying earlier, nobody can be happy if they don't have their own inner approval. And if we're chasing empty victories in the world that don't really matter to our own inner values, then we're not going to be happy. The way we live our lives needs to align to our own inner values in order to find happiness and fulfillment. Therefore, any relationship that's going to be successful long term has to support us following our our highest values, has to support us following our inner guide and has to support the other person living by their highest values and then following their inner guide. So in a sense, you could say the purpose of a relationship is to help each person to hear, understand and follow their own inner guide. A relationship will succeed to the extent that allows each person to follow their inner guide and live by their highest values. Because in that way, each person will feel that they're fulfilling their highest potential. I suspect that relationships that go on long term and are successful long term are those in which the couple discover something beyond romantic love and one way or another make a commitment to the highest and best within each of them and giving scope to each of them to develop and grow in their following of their inner guide. Now following our inner guide doesn't mean following every whim or notion that comes our way. There's a certain amount of maturity required in learning to follow our inner guide. Genuine promptings from the inner guide tend to lead the person towards serving a purpose greater than themselves. They don't tend to lead somebody to simply switching their partner because they want somebody better looking or with more money or whatever. They tend to lead a person towards serving others in some way, to doing something worthwhile and beneficial with their lives not only within their immediate circle, but outside of that circle too. Many romantic relationships take the form of it's us against the world and they create a bubble around themselves, a barrier against the rest of the world in a sense. Now we can get away with that for a while in the beginning of a relationship that's understandable, but eventually the relationship needs to look outwards, needs to offer something beyond itself to society as a whole, not only become a bubble in which the couple can be happy, but it needs to concern itself with the happiness and well-being of others. If a couple don't learn to look at their relationship in a wider perspective, then the relationship tends to fall apart, because in one of them or both of them, their inner guide is going to wake up. The pressure from their inner guide is going to grow stronger and stronger. The calling to to listen to that inner voice will become stronger. And if the relationship is getting in the way of them listening to the inner guide, then sooner or later, the pressure will build up and it will break apart the relationship because the inner guide is pushing them to go in another direction, to bring in different values, to widen out their perspective, to live their life more broadly. They may have specific roles they're playing in that relationship, They may be classically feminine and need to express more of their masculine or they may be classically masculine and needing to express more of the feminine or whatever. But one way or the other, there's other aspects of their being seeking to emerge. If the relationship can't handle them expressing those aspects of themselves, the relationship is likely to run into difficulties. Either that or they'll start to feel really bad because they're not being true to themselves. And any healthy relationship is going to encourage us to be true to the highest and best within us. Of course, in the beginning, sometimes a couple really need to focus on themselves and the relationship in order to build it, in order to create it, in order to give it shape and see what direction it needs to go in. And they may 
withdrawal into themselves as a couple to do that. That's quite normal and natural. It's just a matter of timing and when the relationship needs to develop into something else and needs to become more outward looking because the pressures from within the individuals are pushing them to want to do that. If one of the couple is actively resisting that, then that's what can really cause problems in the relationship. One person is really ready to take the relationship out, more out into the world in some way, or change their their work or vocation in some way, and the other one is threatened by that, then that can really get in the way of the relationship. Just as we as individuals start off needing to be somewhat selfish in order to develop ourselves as individuals, A couple can start off being somewhat selfish in order to develop themselves as a couple. But in the long term, if one person being selfish and self-centered is not a good thing, then why would it be good for a couple in the long term to be self-centered and only focused on themselves? To not just see the world as some place in which we get stuff and get things and it's all about us getting from rather than giving to. And so that reaches a point of a mature relationship when it becomes about giving to the world. And by the world, I mean just whatever society and circumstances we happen to be functioning in. It can be a wider family, a wider society, or whatever. This brings us to another part of the topic of romantic love and is it an illusion? So our relationship with the material world and our attitude towards it can really be one of the primary things that affects how we are in a romantic relationship. If one person feels like they really, really want to make it in the world and they really want to earn a lot more money and have a bigger house and bigger car or whatever, and the other person is not so concerned with that, it could create a division between them. Because if the person who's trying to make it in the world becomes anxious and stressed, maybe even a bit depressed when things don't go their way, it's affecting the partner as well who might well be happier with less stuff. They might well prefer just to have a less stressful life and downsize a bit. Perhaps there's room for compromise within the relationship. But if the person trying to make it in the world sees themselves, defines themselves in that role and sees themselves as only having value to the extent that they can be a provider and that the more they provide, the more value they have, that could be an illusion because the other one's not seeing them that way. What they're seeing is that the more the person can be present and happy in the relationship, that that's more important. The person who's providing may feel like they're making all this sacrifice for the sake of the relationship, when actually the other partner doesn't actually want them to do that. It doesn't want them to go that far. But the person acting as the provider has so locked into seeing themselves as in that role that they drive themselves too hard And the relationship suffers because they come home and they're unhappy and they're stressed. And if that goes on for years, then that's one of the things which can cause at least one of the people in the relationship to feel like the relationship is just not working. How people relate to the material world can be very different and can be very different at different phases of their life. And that's one of the things that can cause a relationship to fall apart when one person's values change or begin to emerge and they're at variance with the other person's values and beliefs about what they should be doing in their lives in terms of work and goals. When we're really focused on making in the world, we get away with it for a while, but then our inner guide begins to prompt us and pressure us to say, this is fine and there's more to life than this. And that inner pressure can awaken in one member of the couple before the other. Then that can really begin to pull them apart. They're beginning to go in separate directions, have different values in life. They maybe had a wonderful romance to begin with. There was a lot of compatibility. There was a lot of affection. But now that at core level, their values are shifting. Their values are changing. If they don't reappraise the relationship and the level of values and changing values, then that can be one of the things that pulls them apart. It's not really an option for somebody to not listen to their inner guide for a long time because that itself can also lead the person into feeling depressed and out of sorts and something not right about life. No matter how much stuff they have, how much success they gain, it's never going to be enough because if their inner source of rightness is saying there's something wrong, it's not going to say 
it's now okay until they align with their inner guide. One of the ways that romantic love serves us is it helps us to understand another person and to become aware of their needs and how to meet their needs and how to get along with somebody else, especially somebody else that's outside of our circle. Somebody's outside of our family circle who may have a different way of thinking and seeing the world than we do and a different way of seeing the world than our family does and learning how to get along with them. It may be for many of us the first time we've ever done that, the first time we've come out of, out of our shell and really got concerned about another person. Becoming concerned about another person and their well-being is obviously a good thing. That can obviously really align with our inner guide's notion of leading us towards a greater capacity to love because that's a step towards enlightened love. So in that sense, if there's any aspects of romantic love that are an illusion or, or that we have illusions about, there are obviously aspects of romantic love that really serve us. They serve us to grow as a person. They help us to develop this deeper capacity to love and be concerned for others. And that's a step in the right direction in terms of where our inner guide is trying to take us. So in a sense then, romantic love helps us to become less self-centred and more aware of the needs and wants of others and how we can find a harmonious way of blending with those needs and becoming a mature and aware individual. So coming back to our initial question, is romantic love an illusion? Obviously a lot depends on the couple and how they as individuals perceive the relationship and how they perceive each other. On the one hand, romantic love leads us out of ourselves, out of our self-centeredness and into a bigger life where we express more caring for others than we would have otherwise. On the other hand, in dealing with a breakup, a separation or a divorce, it can be very painful and it can have long-term emotional and financial consequences, especially if there's children involved. However, even if the relationship falls apart eventually, or the couple go their separate ways, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with the relationship. Perhaps it just has served its purpose. Unfortunately, modern society has a way of almost punishing people when the relationship ends, and it financially can have a huge impact. From an angle of illusions, romantic love may not be an illusion, but we can have illusions about it. We can go from feeling starry-eyed about it, which is probably not particularly realistic, and thinking it this is going to be the ultimate source of our happiness. Or when going through a divorce, we can become very bitter and hard-eyed about it, which is not particularly realistic either. When you go into the dissolution stage, we can begin to doubt not only romantic love, but members of the opposite gender and whether any of them are any good and so we go from reacting to this one particular partner and what they are doing and have done and decide no members of the opposite gender can be trusted and don't want anything to do with any of them ever again and can swing between one extreme to the other. We get into these emotional illusions where we swing from being overly optimistic to being overly pessimistic and neither of us giving us a healthy perspective on what's really going on. Because even though our relationship has ended or is coming to an end in the form it was, it doesn't mean it can't take on another form which can also be useful and beneficial. And it doesn't mean that everything that went before suddenly becomes meaningless. And if we start telling ourselves like, oh, they never loved me anyway and all of that, we don't know that any of that's true. And if we see things through the eye of, bitterness that arises when something's ending, it can give us a very distorted perspective. We're trying to take the value of something which did actually have value. And for one thing, it helped us to develop ourselves, put our attention on somebody else. And to the extent that we cared about another person and were concerned about their well-being, to that extent we grew. We became a kinder and wiser person and more concerned about the needs of others. And that's always a good thing. So we have grown and developed from the relationship, no matter how it ends, even if it ends in a way we hadn't planned in the beginning. Remember earlier I was talking about different types of illusion and one type of illusion is seeing something that just isn't there. And another type of illusion is when we see something that does actually exist, but we're seeing it in a distorted way. The term glamorous illusion is sometimes applied to that kind of illusion 
they have a glamour around them. Now if that seems to you an odd way of using the word glamour, it's actually true to the root of the word. The word glamour is an old Scots word and it partly means a fog or a mist, but it can also mean an enchantment or a spell. So if you combine these, a fog or a mist or an enchantment or a spell, that's very much the effect that glamour has on us. We can become enchanted by it. Later on, when the glamour collapses, then we can go the other way and uh, we get disgusted by it. But basically that's the effect that glamour has on us. It sways our feelings, it sways our emotions. There's often a strong element of emotion to glamorous illusions, sometimes just called a glamour. When we get very starry-eyed about romantic love, then we're seeing it through an attractive glamour. We're seeing it as something beautiful and magnificent that's going to change our life for the better. And to some extent, it does. And then if the relationship ends or for some reason it all goes wrong, we become bitter and cynical about it, which is another glamour. That's an ugly glamour. It's a repulsive glamour. But each stage is the form of glamour. We're not seeing romantic love as it is in the moment. Each perspective, whether overly optimistic and starry-eyed or whether overly pessimistic and bitter and, and cynical, is a distortion of our perspective on romantic love. We're seeing romantic love through a fog of illusion. We go from a spell of being starry-eyed and optimistic to a spell of being cynical and pessimistic. But both of them are spells. Both states are seeing through a fog and not seeing reality, not seeing truly. A glamorous illusion is seeing something which exists, but we're not seeing it for real. We're seeing it in a distorted way, and it's usually our emotions that are causing the distortion that are swinging your perspective one way or the other and causing us to not see the situation clearly. When we're seeing things through an attractive glamour, then we're only seeing what we want to see about the person by exaggerating things about the person or situation which appeal to us. We're only focused on the upside and then we're usually avoiding seeing what potentially could be on the downside and we're avoiding seeing what does not appeal to us about the person or the situation. So romantic love is not an illusion in the sense it's, it's not a mirage, it does actually exist. But it can be we're seeing it through illusions, we have illusions about it. So if we're going back to the core teachings of most spiritual paths, none of them say love is an illusion. In fact, they say that love is the ultimate reality. The ultimate form of love is the ultimate reality that we experience when we become more enlightened. So therefore, romantic love is perhaps the aspect of love which we're more able to access at this time in our evolution. As human beings, we're able to connect with it. So it has a real core truth in it to the extent that it's an expression of love itself. So to the extent that we can approach romantic love through this core of love, then we're aligned with this ultimate sense of love which is where our inner guide is trying to lead us. It may be trying to lead us through romantic love as a way of discovering a deeper form of love and as a pathway to that. But the problem is we create a lot of glamours around it which causes to be disillusioned later and which completely skews our perspective. First our perspective is skewed to the upside and the optimistic side and then later on it can get skewed to the downside and may become on the pessimistic side. Each view is distorting a perspective. So although romantic love is not an illusion to the extent that it's an expression of this core aspect of love and is leading us towards that, however, we weave all sorts of glamours around it that bring in all sorts of illusions into the situation. Usually as a couple are getting to know each other, they're on their best behaviour. And they might dress better than they normally would dress. They maybe behave better than they would normally behave. Maybe being kinder than they would normally be. More considerate of the other person than they would normally be. But you don't get to know what this person is really like till after we're married and settled. And maybe not even for a couple of years after that. Till finally one or both of the couple are, get too exhausted keeping up their pretense that they drop it. And start to allow their real character and personalities to come through. 
which can be a rude awakening for the other person. So effectively, initially, we each present a glamorous version of ourselves to the other person. And they're doing that to us. So we get a distorted idea, a glamorized idea about what it's going to be like to be in a relationship with this person. Then the idea of marriage can have all sorts of layers of glamorous illusion around it. And even though we do manage to marry the person of our dreams, we eventually face the disillusionment of dealing with the mundane facts of everyday life. Paying the bills, earning money, dealing with the problems of daily life. We might be tempted to ask ourselves, well, if this is my dream come true, why am I not happy? I'm never supposed to be happy. And I'm not happy. Is this the wrong person? Am I with the wrong person? Did I marry the wrong person? Have they changed in some way? Were they pretending to be somebody else? Well, possibly they were because we were pretending to be somebody else, more than likely. In addition, society itself often glamorizes romantic love. All the happy ever after stories, all of the, the songs, having words like, I'll never love another. Well, what kind of view is that? Does that make any sense? That isn't that kind of a selfish stance for somebody to offer that and to somebody else to expect it? It's a very closed-hearted way of life. Anything that's closed-hearted limits love and person's capacity to love is asking for trouble because sooner or later their inner guide will step in and want them to expand their capacity to love and to develop their capacity to love to include others. And that's why I don't usually use the term unconditional love to describe this enlightened love because this enlightened love is also much more universal. It tends to want to broaden out and include other people, other people beyond our immediate circle. That's the nature of it. So an exclusive us two against the world doesn't really work well for this kind of love because it's a broadening outward. Just like romantic love initially broadens our outlook and gets us outside of our shell and showing care for another person. The next step is that love wants to include a lot more other people, initially within the circle of our family, but then beyond that and to include more people and more aspects of life. That's the nature of that love. So basing a relationship on a love that's exclusive and is not inclusive is sooner or later asking for trouble. That doesn't mean we can't have a primary relationship with one specific person because there's all sorts of financial ties and other issues to do with having a primary relationship with somebody. It's the nature of life that we feel a deep love for other people, but we don't have to follow through on it if we have a stable relationship with somebody and then we see somebody else and feel this deep love for them. It doesn't mean that we're with the wrong person. It may just be an infatuation. It may be a genuine love, but it doesn't mean we need to do anything about it. We can acknowledge it for what it is. We can be very tempted in the excitement of that new love to begin to diminish in our minds the love we already have. And maybe we need to move to that new one, but maybe not. Because we're experiencing the glamour of that new relationship, whereas the glamour in the current relationship has diminished and we're getting more real about it. But it's also becoming more genuine, whereas the new one... The new love has a lot more glamour around it and we don't know what's really genuine about it. We don't know how much we've made up and what's really real. Again, we're only seeing the best in that person. We're not looking at the downside. We're only seeing the upside. And in a current relationship, we're only seeing the downside and not seeing the upside. So on the one hand, we need to be open to loving other people, but not necessarily doing anything about it other than just enjoying the feelings of it and being careful to limit the ways that we express that love. And society also strengthens and supports this idea of romantic love and building lots of glamour around it. There's many businesses rely on glamorizing romantic love and marriage. It's a huge industry feeding the glamorous illusions around romantic love, which if we buy into them, will distort our perspective and stop us seeing the real value of romantic love and the way of enabling us to learn to love another person, helping to connect with their inner guide and to live out from the highest and best within us. Instead, romantic love becomes this distorted thing 
this odd thing in its own right, which gets disconnected from the rest of life and becomes something exclusive and only about us as a couple and us as a family and nothing to do the rest of life. See, one way of looking at romantic love is to simply see it as part of our path in learning about love and learning to love another person. All the glitz and glamour are not what it's really about. It's really about learning to love another person in this moment and looking for ways that we can express that that works within the society in which we live. It's not necessarily true that this person we love is going to be the only love of our life because for the most part they're not the only love of our life. If we try and make them the only love of our life more often than not the statistics show in terms of broken relationships and broken marriages that it actually doesn't really work very well to do that. Now social constraints and our own personal preferences can result in us having a very specific form of committed relationship with that particular person and there's nothing wrong with that. We still need to be aware that sooner or later we may find ourselves needing and wanting to love other people but as I was saying earlier to do so in another form and not automatically assume that we need to ditch the one we've got and get somebody else because they just seem more exciting and not necessarily ditching the relationship we have because it didn't live up to the romantic illusion of happy ever after. There is no happy ever after in that shape. The happy ever after comes from deepening into our capacity to love, not in trying to create an exclusive love with one specific person. We can keep the exclusivity in the social level, but not on the level of love. Love by nature is universal and reaches out to expand itself. Rather than looking for the one and only version of love, we need to look for this universal love of loving more and more people. We need to get used to loving lots of people. The world needs us to do that. The health of society needs us to do that. And romantic love can be a wonderful vehicle for learning the initial steps in loving and caring for another person. But there's no need to stop there. There's no need to stop that. that. And if we see part of the role of that relationship is for each of us to learn to love more fully and more widely and not as an exclusive thing. And that will naturally include not doing things that will unnecessarily harm the current relationship we're in. In fact, it will deepen our value for that relationship if we approach it in healthy ways. Usually what spiritual teachers express is essentially a love for all of humanity. It's very inclusive and very outreaching. And that's what they're trying to lead us towards. That, in a sense, is what our own inner guide is trying to lead us towards. Each step comes to us when we're ready, and it's a natural evolution. And perhaps that is the natural evolution of humanity, is that we learn to love more and more of each other and create a world and a society that's based on that love. Romantic love and the way we tend to idealise that person and be able to see the best in them is very good practice. It's good training to then go on and be able to see the best in other people and the best in more people and be able to learn to connect with them and look for ways we can help them. As we do that, as we gain in our capacity to love and to help other people, then we begin to move into a more loving state in our daily life. Our thinking and feeling tends to revolve around that loving state. Just like when we have a romantic obsession with somebody, our time and attention and our thoughts and feelings go into how adorable they are. That's wonderful training for then the next step, for being able to give time and attention to other people we love and our people we care about, and maybe even a growing love for wider society or for nature. Our sense and capacity to love grows and expands. So romantic love is, yet again, is helping us to awaken to that wider capacity to love. But it in itself is not the ultimate goal. The goal of our inner guide seems to be more of this universal love to help us to cultivate this enlightened love, which is more unconditional, more universal. If a romantic relationship doesn't work out in the way we hoped, it can still have had a major impact on our life 
it can still have been a major success and it was a step into this deeper form of love. It was a step out of ourselves into loving somebody else and which then gets us ready for the next step in learning to love. Now, it may be hard to accept that if we're feeling very bitter and angry during a divorce or separation of some kind. Yet ultimately, it can still lead us to our greater happiness. Because once we've let go of the, the ugly glamour that comes when something's breaking up, we come back to more of a reality and more able to see the value of what we had, that nothing is ever lost. There were benefits in that relationship. There were times when we were happy in the relationship. We had those good times. We have the learning we got from that relationship. It's not gone. No relationship is ever a failure in the ultimate sense. There's always learning what not to do, even if we see ourselves as having made lots of mistakes, that we chose the wrong person or whatever. It was always a growing, it was always learning about how to relate to another person. It's always broken our shell a bit, got us out of ourselves and into being a bigger part of ourselves, being a bigger version of ourselves to step into that relationship. So in a sense, no relationship is ultimately a failure. It's all part of life and learning. It all develops our character, you can say. It all develops different aspects of ourselves. Any attempt to learn to love another person was a good step to take. No matter how it turned out, it was a very good thing to attempt. When we see romantic love as a gateway to something higher, it can serve as well. Learning to love and care for another person is a glorious thing, especially if it awakens in us an ability to love more people and to fall in love with life in general. Romantic love can help us awaken to the beauty and wonder of life. Now that's something that's very real. It's a very real experience. However, romantic love is not forever. A person in a relationship with is unlikely to be around forever. The type of romantic relationships that work well for a long time and are enduring are ones in which the couple really learn to go beyond romantic love and to discover something deeper. And they use their relationship as the basis for something greater, for reaching out beyond themselves, for allowing the love within themselves to touch the lives of others beyond their immediate circle. And they each encourage the other to flourish in that way and don't try and limit the loving capacity of the other. Usually they make a commitment to each other as being the the primary form of relationship they have, but they let it be a container that radiates outwards to others and isn't limited to just them. So in a sense, such a couple are not living in a way it's us against the world. They're living in a sense of, us for the world, us contributing to the greater life. And this is what enables them to have a relationship that endures because it's bigger than just them. And that enables that the relationship to draw nourishment from outside itself. And they're not like a, you know, a couple of plants stuck in a pot together. They're rooted in a greater life. And so they can be more enduring. Ultimately, the the only certain path to happiness and fulfillment is to let our inner guide lead us, to learn to listen and respond to the promptings of the highest and best within ourselves, and to follow those promptings. Those inner promptings will sometimes take us into a, a relationship which is in the form of romantic love. We can help to ensure that romantic relationship is long term if we allow it to be part of our path to learning to love and to see it as part of our path to learning a greater and greater capacity to love. As part of this, we can learn to cultivate enlightened love. Poetically, we could say that love is a flower with many petals. So there's many qualities that we can cultivate and develop that are part of that. It could be kindness, compassion, appreciation of beauty, art, enjoyment of nature, And of course, learning to love and appreciate more people and learning to love and appreciate more of life. To summarize then, I would say 
Romantic love is not an illusion, but it can be. We're seeing it through illusions. We have illusions about it. The way out of those illusions are to, to be able to do some good hard thinking about the type of relationship we're in and adjusting our expectations to make our relationships more workable and less based on forever and the ultimate person and instead see it as a pathway, as a pathway to a greater capacity to love. It may well also be that we need to consider the deeper values, the deeper values of the other person we are with and the deeper values of our own nature, possibly adjust our lifestyle and our goals in life so that our way of making our livelihood in the world doesn't cause unnecessary stress to a relationship. Romantic love serves us best when it allows us to reach more unconditional, more universal form of love, not only for this one particular person, but to more people, and to ultimately to fall in love with life itself. <laughs>